Hello, everyone. Tonight's topic is uh, Dare to Dare. Based on a uh, a lesson in courage from a profile called Abraham, a man who lived close to 4,000 years ago, around 3,800 years ago, who we read about in this week's Torah portions. As some of you may know, every week of the 52 weeks of the year, we have a corresponding portion in the Bible and the Torah, which is read in the synagogues on Saturday on Shabbat, as well as a part of it, the opening is also read on Monday and Thursday. Uh, basically that we don't go three days without the reading of the Torah. Now for many, reading the Bible or the Torah seems like an archaic exercise because when you read ostensibly the language, even if you know Hebrew, it appears that it's discussing things that happen at a different time, a different place, under different circumstances. And even though there are inspirational lessons, many will wonder what relevance does most of it have to us. On the other hand, you go on a subway, almost every subway ride you'll ever take, you'll find a few people reading the Bible. It's usually elderly black women. Um, and I don't mean that in any negative way, because at the same time, the Bible remains the single biggest best-selling book till this day, to the point that it's not even recorded on the best-seller charts of the New York Times because it just sells so many, they don't even consider it. Which itself is an interesting study of media, of reality. If someone to look at the bestseller list, you'd think these are the, bo- the books selling most this week. But they're not. Because the Bible outsells all those books uh, year after year after year. So they have their reason, of course, because you know, how many years can you have the Bible? They would have to have, uh, the, you know, the, New- the Bible outlasts the New York Times even, the venerable New York Times. So that would create a conundrum. <clears throat> of sorts, because then the Bible, the New York Times would have to write something like that 20,000 weeks, or 30,000 weeks, I don't know how many weeks, 52 weeks, that, and someone would wonder, one second, the New York Times wasn't even here. So that would basically render the New York Times irrelevant, because the Bible outlived it. But beyond the um, social satire about all this, the fact is that the Bible remains an enigma in our times, because on one hand, it remains, as I said, the big best, best-selling book. It remains the foundation of, of the three major religions, From starting with Judaism, Christianity, Islam. It remains a book that still cap- captivates every time a film is made about biblical stories, whether it's the Ten Commandments, Cecil B. DeMille's Ten Commandments, or the Prince of Egypt, or cartoons, the stories of the Garden of Eden, the Exodus, Pharaoh, etc., etc. These themes continue to resonate. However, as I said, most contemporary individuals in the secular world have no idea what most of the relevance of the Torah is to us. One of my objectives in this class is to demonstrate that when you really decipher the words and the ideas and strip them from their uh, so-called external uh, words, it really carries eternal spiritual messages that are as relevant today as they were then. And they really transcend time and space because it's not a book of geography, it's not a book of history, it's not a book of events that happened in the past. It's actually a spiritual blueprint for life. So each chapter carries its themes and its relevant themes to our lives. You know, one day I hope to, I don't know if I'll ever end up doing it, one of my dreams is to write a, a definitive spiritual Bible, which would really just tell the story in psychologically relevant and contemporary terms of the whole Torah in one structure. But as it is, these classes that I've been giving, this goes back now 30 years. If you accumulatively, that's what I've been doing week after week, trying to take a theme and applying it to our personal lives. But not just forcing the issue and trying to just force some idea, but actually looking at the story and, as I said, stripping it from all its externals, getting to the core of it, and we can derive. And this is based primarily on the mystical and the spiritual ideas within each theme, within each character, within each narrative and find profoundly resonating themes and uh, messages and insights into our own lives. And I essentially do here in this room what I would do with myself as I began to explore in my younger years and uh, began to, uh, was, was, was uh, completely uh, mesmerized by the relevance. 
and how it resonated. The idea is that I have, how would you, how would the Torah know these things about my own soul, about our own psyches and our own challenges? So I basically do share my own journey here, and uh, and I find it to be when it's properly presented like music. What is music? Music resonates. Why does music touch us? Not because somebody's forcing it upon us, not because it's some type of ritual. Music touches the soul, and it's undeniable. No one has to prove it to you. It just does it. Uh, my goal is that the Torah should be able to do the same thing when read the proper way. So with that introduction, let's go back to Abraham studying courage. And I said, dare to dare. So let's start with an opening question. I'm sure many of you, like I did when we were in high school, one of the required books was The Red Badge of Courage. You remember that book? Who is it, Conrad? Huh? Yeah. So essentially it's a story. It's a story usually read in high school because it's a coming-of-age story of uh, growing up, basically. This story is based, I believe, the Civil War, where this individual young man is drafted to the army, and he doesn't have the courage to go fight, so he's always hiding. Every time there's a battle, he figures out a way to hide somewhere. I mean, I'm, I'm simplifying it. But essentially what happens is he ends up the shame, the embarrassment of when his own colleagues went out to war. Some of them got killed. And he basically faked it. So when he came back from the battlefield, everyone thought he also went to battle. Little did they know that he was constantly hiding, like under a table or behind a tree. And so it's a sense of coming of age where a person comes to address the fears of one's life the, and build the courage necessary to confront all challenges in life. So it's a universal theme. There are many different novels and books that have been written about it. And, and it affects each one of us. Which brings us to the main question, like, I don't know, we, thank God we don't have to be drafted into war, but we all have our battles. And the first time you face them, they're very disconcerting, very difficult. Most of us do not like confrontation, period. And when we're faced with confrontation, our first choice would be to avoid it. There are some of us that love confrontation, and our first choice is always to confront. So that's another type of character, which also requires analysis. But what is this thing about us, in our, which of course touches upon our fears and our habits, that even if something is not working in our lives, there's something fundamental. Take a relate relationships. It's clearly evidence, empirical evidence in your own life. You look, your relationships are not working. And I hope this isn't relevant to anyone sitting here, but somewhere in cyberspace this may be relevant to one or two people on this earth. Where you go through a relationship, it didn't work out. Another one. You know, in the beginning you uh, maybe have your scapegoats and usual suspects to blame. But at some point, you start wondering, are you doing anything wrong? And, you know, we all have our blind spots, so it's very likely that we maybe do something wrong. It's not always being done to us. I'm just using that example. I'm not using artificial things because that's where our subjectivity comes into play. Why is it, even if we are clear that we're making mistakes, difficult for us to forge a new path? to try something really new. And especially in a sustainable way. I don't mean just for a moment. So the obvious reason is, number one, there's a certain element of habit and routine, much more powerful than we think it is. So it creates resistance. For newborn children, or young children, their resilience, they've not been shaped yet and defined. So it's not difficult for them to, cr to change paths. That's why if they, ha they haven't had developed bad habits. If you teach them good habits at the outset, it's far easier then someone who's already developed a bad habit, that bad routine, and they've, they've basically hardened into a certain pattern, to unlearn and, be, and to learn something new is, is harder. That's one, one reason. None of us even know how much resistance inertia and status quo creates. But it definitely it's a factor. And a second factor that needs to be considered is fear. Our fears. Fears of the known, of the unknown, Real fears, false fears. So obviously to address a topic like this is really understanding, courage really has to understand the antithesis of it, fear. Again, newborn children, young children are fearless. As a matter of fact, they need to be controlled not to get themselves into trouble, not to touch the fire, not to put their hands in the room, not to cross the street on their own, because they have no idea of the, of the dangers around them. But as we grow into adults, we've developed fears. So, again, without a deep analysis, even though I don't like to be generic, but generally fears come from the things we pick up 
in our formative years. If our parents are fearful, most likely you will assume some of those fears. Because that's what you see. And it's a norm. You don't see it as an aberration. You see that as the people that you worship or the people that are shaping you, for good or for bad, have fears. So they fears will usually project upon us. Then there are fears that may not come directly from parents or adults, can come from events and experiences in our lives. You know, if a child, for example, was shy and laughed at consistently, you start creating fear, fear of expression, invalidation that ends up causing fears. I mean, the list goes on, but they all go down to the earlier in our lives where we've experienced some form of uh, embarrassment or some form of invalidation or some form of lack of validation will usually create, help create certain fears in us. Fear, as I said, fear of expression. Every time you spoke, someone laughed at you. Or you were dismissed. Or you, were, or you stuttered. And something like that. It gets far worse. We all know stuttering is very much connected to psychological fear. Which is why people on their own don't study. They only stutter when they're around others. It's a whole other discussion. A few years ago in the King's Speech, this was a whole analysis. That film that uh, resonated for many, even though many of us are not stutterers, but the idea of fears. We all have our fears. And they express themselves in different ways. And then, of course, there's always the second and third collateral damage. What do we do to compensate for fears or for routines? As we get older, we usually cause more problems. Because you compensate. Instead of fixing it, what you do is you cover up. And you do, sometimes people develop a certain bravado a fake bravado and a fake confidence because they're covering up on real in, in, uh, deeper, deeper, de- uh, deep-rested fears within them. So when you look at our, when you look, when we look at ourselves in the mirror as we are right now, we're a jumble. We're a we're a product of a jumble of all these different experiences, and most of them we're not even aware of. And they all contribute to this issue of our making moves in our lives. So right now, as we speak, every one of us has all kinds of forces that are um, limiting us, our ability to truly be ourselves. Which of course brings me to the next point, which is the main motivation for any discussion on this topic is, what potential do we carry? How much is really not being realized and remain trapped inside of you due to these factors that I described, or more factors than that? How many things, do, and, and, and we may not know, not only don't we know our potential, we also don't know the, all the forces that are stopping them from to express themselves. So then there are times in life where all this becomes, smacks us right in the face when we see it very obviously, when something really breaks down. Or where you see in a very uh, blatant way that you're able to, that you know that you have the capacity to do something and something is just not, le- not letting you to get there. So this is the central theme of the story of Abraham. And that's why it's so relevant. Because as I've described it now, no one would think this is a biblical theme. But remember, when you cut through, as I said, the, the externals of the geography and of the date when this all happened, human beings have been struggling with this issue from the beginning of time. We all are children of parents. No matter what generation and what millennium, we all have potential. We all have dreams and aspirations. <clears throat> We all begin our earlier in our lives with everything is possible. And as years roll on, those possibilities start lowering. We, we, not, des- not the possibilities, but our attitude. We become more resigned. If you, look in the, if you look how the clock works, very few people become less resigned as they get older. It usually works the other way around. You're less resigned and you become more resigned. And with good excuse, life wears us down. The cruelties of life, the disappointments... The, the hopes, dashed hopes, broken promises, all the other expectations unrealized, etc., etc. So Abraham remains a shining example, being our forefather. He's not only a lesson in history, he's actually, we have his genes. And in the Medrash, which is Talmudic, an oral interpretation of the Torah, and especially in the mystical, we're told that we have an Abraham inside of us. But we also have other forces. So in a way, if we can study his life and emulate it to some extent and also look at the challenges that we face we can discover new, I wouldn't say new we can uncover new tools that we may not have known that we have inside of us to battle and fight these challenges but as always, as I always describe Yediyaz Hamach Lechetzi Refua in Hebrew, which means 
awareness of a problem is half the cure. So a big part of addressing any issue is understanding what, what is the problem. You know, it's not just about having a, a, a brilliant mind be able to uh, f- look for solutions. When you understand the problem well, you're halfway there. Just like another expression, a similar expression, which can be connected to the first expression, is that the question of a wise person is half an answer. So awareness is half a cure, and a question is half an answer. Many of us, when we ask questions, and we're looking to exploring, we're looking, we're seeking something, often it's the question that needs, you need help with more than the answer. And actually, the wise mentor will be the one that helps you formulate your question. What is the question you have? And you may be surprised. You know, most of us say, well, I know my question. I just need answers. It's not so true. Think about it. Again, I'm not talking about superficial things. Where's the closest grocery store? That obviously, uh, you know, it's a matter of finding out where it is. We're talking about deeper issues. We usually do not know how to articulate the question. And we may not even be phrasing it right. And you also, more importantly, you may be focusing the question on the symptoms than on the root. So if you go to a doctor and say, my question is, how do I heal? My finger keeps bleeding. That may not be the question. That's the symptom. The question may be, what's causing your finger to be bleeding? And that you may not even know how to pose that question. So it's always important, not just because of humility. A lot of extra curriculum. It's making sounds. Hmm? So, it's, so, it's, so not only the name of humility, but also the name of the seeking for truth is to realize that any question you ask, it's always important to say, I feel this is my question. That's where you'll find in some of the prayers, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, other times, you'll find a, um, the expression, you say, like in the Elah, the fifth final prayer in Yom Kippur, we say to God, we are few, people few, with few words. We're weak. We don't always know what to say. So we ask you to take that into account. Which, of course, opens up opportunities that if you ask somebody a question, you could also say, you know, based on my understanding or based on my research, here's what I think. Opening up the possibility that you may not have all figured out, even your question. So let's uh, review a few aspects of Abraham's story and life and then study its parallels to us and take some lessons. Now, remember, Abraham comes around in a time where there were no religious institutions altogether. Um, there were institutions, there have always been institutions. As soon as they're human beings, they have institutions, bureaucracies. Abraham was born in a time where they call a pagan world. His father was actually an idol manufacturer. Not idol as I-D-L-E, but idol, I-D-O-L. He was a manufacturer. He made a lot of money selling gods to people. Basically, uh, it was like the, 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 the modern day psychic, if you wish which you find in most many storefronts, Manhattan and other places. So people would come to him and he would have an idol for whatever your needs were. I know it sounds a little funny, but that's how it was. And uh, Abraham, being who he was, as a child, realized there's something wrong with this whole thing. He sensed, as, mo- as, most seekers sen- as all seekers sense, that there's something more to reality and to life than what's the obvious Realize that the material world is just a surface. And this is the truth as any seeker, any thinker, whether from a spiritual perspective or from a scientific perspective, that's the essence of all wisdom, is to realize that the surface is just the surface. There's something that makes this thing tick. So whether it's an expert in uh, economic trends, if there's such a thing, or an expert in uh, recognizing patterns, or an expert in medicine or science, you know, people who look at something where the naked eye or the untrained eye of the lay person will just see external forces, and a trained person will see a pattern, will see a trend, will see a law. Essentially, if you want to sum up science, is understanding the underlying unifying laws that explain the multitude of phenomena. And Abraham was exactly such a man. He was growing up in a home and was looking for what is this all about? Why are we here? All the big questions that we ask. And he had a father, his name was Terach, who clearly was selling meaning to people. But he was selling it in the form of idols. What were idols? Idols were symbols of some type of either divinity, transcendence, and so on. They were made out of stones, out of wood. 
We're not going to submit and suggest that necessarily some type of stupid uh, primitive act because idol worship was actually very sophisticated. We have it today too. Many things we buy, we may not call them idols, but we worship them. You know, you have, for example, sports worship. You have people who worship uh, money. You have people who worship many things. Maybe we don't like to use the word worship. It sounds too religious. But you know the word fan, F-A-N, is short for fanatic. But you don't never hear anyone say a sports fanatic and a religious fan. You know, But that's the same word. It means some type of obsessive commitment to something that not necessarily have real value. So the, and human beings in all of history always needed to have crutches, always search for things. And sometimes what they got in return was something completely unreal, but it satisfied them. How many panaceas, how many uh, uh, false idols do we worship in our lives? What we think is valuable. Then one day you wake up, you have a reality uh, check that what you thought was so important is really meaningless. So in those times, the time wasn't different. And Abraham was searching for something more real. Some call it the search for God. Whatever word you want to use for it, but it's a search that it's something that was not man-made. Something that was not just a fabrication or some type of man-made institution, man controlling other men. So he went out to search. Through process of elimination, he realized it can be something that is constructed by human beings. And through his own search, he began to find answers. But he didn't find his ultimate answer until he came to the ultimate reality, a realization, the ultimate epiphany. And that epiphany was that his search itself was based on a false premise because he realized that if I and every human being on this earth is only part of a larger reality, how can the part dictate the whole? He realized that that itself is a subtle form of arrogance. It's I am defining and trying to understand the whole when I'm really a part of a whole. If that's true, I have to shut down and let the whole emerge within me. It's like uh, the example I've given in the past when people ask the question about death. No one should know of that. Where does a soul go to upon death? Question people ask. Where does that life go to? The life I knew, the life I loved, now is just a inanimate, a dead corpse. I don't mean to be sound morbid, but it's the question that many of us ask. Here, the same person was alive, now all that's left is a shell. I witness this myself personally when my father passed away. There's so one moment like that, one moment like that. It's a mystery. So we ask the question, where did that life go? Did it go anywhere? But if you think about it, the question itself is based on a arrogant premise. What is the premise? The premise is, I am where it's at. So I wonder where this all went. Who, this, who said you are where it's at? How do you know that you are the center of existence? So let's create an imaginary dialogue between a refrigerator and electricity. So the refrigerator asks the electricity, where do you go when they pull the plug? So of course the electricity responds to the refrigerator if it's going to respond and give it the dignity of a response. What chutzpah, what nerve do you have? You're a little box that they invented the last 100, 200 years ago to refrigerate food. You're generating my electricity, confining it in the box for a short while, and now you think you're the center of the universe. You ask me where I go. I was here long before you ever existed, long before everyone, anyone even conceived of you. I just go back to my natural habitat, which is not confined in time and space as you know it. All you know is your little box. And when you think about it, it's exactly true, of course. By asking question where the soul goes is assuming that our perception of reality is 100%, and where does the soul go? Maybe we have a very small percentage. Maybe we only see the tip of the iceberg. It would be like the tip of the iceberg asking, where, where, where do I come from? You know, you come from a big mountain of ice that nobody can see. It's under the water. Someone asks, what makes the world tick today? Nobody will say it's apparent to the naked eye, to our five senses. You can't experience what makes the world tick with your senses. We know that what we see with our senses are the outer layer, outer, outer surface. And maybe outer, 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 I don't know how many levels of outer, of, of forces under the surface that shape us. If it's in the human being, it's DNA, cells, subcells. 
if you talk on a physics level, it's not just elements made of molecules, made of atoms, it's subatomic particles, sub-subatomic particles. If you talk about intelligence, it's not just the conscious, it's the unconscious, the un-unconscious, and who knows how many layers are there beneath the surface when you go down the rabbit hole, as they say. So, today, any wise person knows we know a lot. But we also know that what we know is just a very small part of the picture. What do we know about this brain of ours that's in this head? A brain that's about the size of a palm of the hand. How many ideas can this brain contain? We know a hard drive contains a certain amount, then it runs out of memory. What about our brain? And what about all the mysteries of the brain? We're just beginning to get a little glimpse of it all. So the point is not to suggest that we don't know anything. That's not what I'm trying to do. We know a lot. Look what we've done with our knowledge. But how much more knowledge? So what do we know about the whole? We know about the peace. And that's what Abraham realized. That the secret to finding truth is to stop taking yourself so seriously. And you have to let go and let truth emerge. The secret to any type of resonating experience, I mentioned music before, is not trying to grab the music and force it inside you. It's shut down. Let it penetrate. Let it enter you. Absorb it. And then it emerges. Something emerges. You're touched by something. Love. Can you go and buy love? Is it a commodity that you can get off a shelf? Or maybe we have to do something to make ourselves more receptive and free ourselves of some things, and then things emerge. As I've discussed many times, all things real are not acquirable. And they all emerge. They all require a process. They don't just, you can't just grab it. You can't take a seed and no matter what you do with it, jam it or bang it or, or, or shoot it with laser energy, it's going to grow into a tree. No, the seed got to be going to the ground. You have to nurture it, care for it, it needs water. And slowly, slowly it will emerge. Abraham came to that discovery. Now in this week's chapter, there are many different parts of the narrative. I'm not going to go through them all. I want to just take this and take this a step further. There's discussion about a battle that Abraham fights with the different kings. But at the end of the chapter, close to the end, where where before God makes his covenant with Abraham, you have the story that um, one of the kings that he battled with, and Abraham had conquered hostages and so on, so this king comes to him and says to him these words, Ten li nefesh, give me the souls, and you can keep the property. This is after, he wanted to make a truce, let's end the war, give me the souls that you've conquered, and you can keep the property. This word, ten li nefesh, is a very powerful expression. Because as we'll soon see, it's really the battle over the soul. That there are two forces that battle over our souls. Who's going to own your soul? And this is a key component in learning how to dare learning how to develop courage, which is learning who's going to win your soul. Because it's the soul that is the key thing. And that's why this king makes the focus. He says, the property I don't care about. I don't care about everything. Just give me the soul. Who, care, can, who controls the soul is the one who controls the destiny. Think of it of our children. Who controls the soul of our children? They're born with pure, innocent souls, pure, innocent minds and hearts. Everything is a clean slate. Who controls, who will control this entity called the pure soul of a newborn child? And we were all once this newborn child. And if you identify that as the battle zone, battleground, that's where courage is built or courage is destroyed. That's where fear is born or that's where strength is born. So we'll discuss that in a few moments in a little more detail. And then you find right after that in the verses, what I just read to you was... What verse was that? Um, here we go. Ten Leon Nefesh is chapter, just if you want to look it up, in your home uh, or wherever you want to look at it. It's chapter 14, verse 21. Am I right? 1421. Let me make sure. Yeah, 1421. Then when you read a few chap- a few verses further, he goes on and says in chapter 15 now, and that after these words, God speaks to Abraham in a vision. And he says to him, Altira Avram, don't be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield to protect you from any of your challenges. 
That's what it says. Anoichi mogen loch schach kahar b'mayid, and your reward will be great. It's a cryptic verse. So I want to discuss this verse in context of the Abraham's journey. Now, to really understand it properly in context, the beginning of this chapter, Lech Lecha, is um, immediately jumps at us as, with a question. If you read it closely, you discover that Abraham was 75 years old when this chapter begins. So we really know very little about Abraham for the first 75 years of his life. His, his birth is documented in the last chapter, and just to his family, but that's it. The story begins with Lech Lecha. What's Lech Lecha? Abraham lived in uh, Ur Kazdim, which was a city in what is modern day south eastern Iraq, of all places. Not far from where the center of most of the Middle East trouble is happening. Right there, southeastern Iraq, near the Gulf, near the Persian Gulf. There's a lot of oil there. Then and uh, and now too. And the first commandment to Abraham, the Jew, is at age 75, is Lech Lecha, leave your homeland. Lech Lecha, Ma'atzecha, your land. Ma'atzecha, the place of your birth. And Beis Avicha, the home of your parents. And go to the land that I will show you. And Abraham travels north, west. He travels along the Euphrates, which as we know goes right through Iraq. And then when you go west from the Euphrates, you go through Jordan or Syria to the land of Canaan, as it was called then, which we call the land of Israel. And this begins a journey. As we all know, it's probably the single biggest journey in all of history. This would be the birth of Judaism. Later would give birth to Christianity and Islam. Until this day, this is the hotbed of earth. The biggest battles were all fought over the city called Jerusalem, over the land of Israel. There's no place on earth where more battles have been fought, through religions, through nations. Everybody feels that you have to control Israel if you want to control the world. Why that is, is there's not the scope of our discussion. I've, I've given classes on this topic. But clearly that part, that part of geography is not a small factor, and it affects us till this day. For many of us it's a mystery. What are they fighting about? What are they fighting? What do they want? What does everybody want? Whether Jews or the Muslims or the Christians or the Crusaders throughout history, the Ottoman Empire, this little piece of land. And it all begins with Abraham who traveled there and settled there. He bought later, he will buy the Ma'arat HaMachpelah, which we'll read in two weeks, which is the, the, in Hebron, the, 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 the grave site, which is the burial ground of where Abraham and Sarah would end up. He bought it for his wife Sarah. Abraham would be buried there, Isaac and Rebekah. Jacob and Leah, Adam and Eve, Hebron until this day. There's complete battles going on there. Travel there and you'll see what's going on thousands of years later. So clearly this Abraham was both a great pioneer, but also someone called maybe the beginning of all trouble. But you know, maybe it's uh, interdependent. Great pioneers cause trouble. I mean good trouble in this case. So you see just from observation and historical study, that there's something about Abraham and his journey, this Lech Lecha, this chapter that changed the universe. Now, of course, it changed the universe in the most obvious way that Abraham was the first to embrace a pro- policy of justice, social justice. He is the father of social justice. His commitment in this chapter is to teach his children and his family and to generations to come that even though we naturally can be selfish, and narcissistic, and take care of ourselves, our dedication has to be is to of justice and charity. He opened his home, his tent, and with this was born a concept that was unknown until that point. Even today, it's not natural for many of us, but it's become the norm. It's become a standard. Everyone knows, even those that may not be so giving, know it's giving is considered to be a virtue. Abraham is the father of all of this. So you can imagine that this man has a lot of secrets. And he was not, being a pioneer, he had no one to turn to. Well, who inspired him? It wasn't his father or his mother. He actually defied everybody and he challenged them. Because when he began to 
explorer, he wasn't quiet about it. He spoke about it. And he developed, he had many, many students. And he defied the leaders of the time that were completely about power. If you think the monarchs in the Middle Ages were, 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 were tyrants and uh, despots and total monopolies over control, you can imagine in those days what it was like. And Abraham challenged it. Abraham said, no, it doesn't matter whether Nimrod, who was the king then, who was like the, the superpower of all, the whole world, which was essentially the Mesopotamian Valley. And that's where civilization, the cradle of civilization. Um, and he challenged the authority. He says, every human being is entitled to rights. It's pretty forward thinking for a person 3,800 years ago. It didn't become institutionalized until 200 years ago, 300 years ago, the idea that all people are created equal and social justice. It was an ideal written about by some philosophers, some aspired to it, but institutionalized just 300 years ago. So that's pretty amazing. There was a man that stood up for that, and he didn't just stand up. This is what, this is what he taught his children, and his children would teach it to their grandchildren. And he ruffled many feathers, rocked the boat, so he clearly had a lot of courage and strength. So this journey begins Lech Lecha. And if you think about it, it's really a journey that we all go on. Perhaps not in such dramatic terms, but we all go on this journey where we, we come of age. And the question is, are you going to make your mark? Or are you going to become a conformist? Or are you just going to follow the patterns and routines that were passed on to you and, uh, and, not, and never rock the boat? I'm not just talking about uh, going against cultural norms, but against your own fears and your own um, limitations. So what is it that Abraham discovered that helped him do that? And how can we discover the same thing within ourselves? So I've discussed at length many times the meaning of Lech Lecha. And briefly, the key, the first step, the key to it all, and Abraham, age 75, was able to reach that. But we can do reach it far earlier because he paved the way already for us. So he broke ground, broke the ground. Is that, in an odd way, when the Torah, the Torah says, God tells Abraham, go, he describes in detail his point of departure. Leave your land, place of your, the Atzchamalat, the place of your birth and the home of your parents. But when it comes to the destination, God is very vague. Go to the land that I will show you. When you give someone directions, usually it's the other way around. Like we have a GPS, you have to punch in the details of your destination, not of your location. You know where you are, or the GPS finds where you are. The location is the key, the destination is the key. And here is the other way around. God, the d- destination is vague, the land I will show you. East, west, south, north, where is it? What's the address? What country? What city? What mountain? What valley? Signposts. When it comes to the departure, God says, your land, your place of your birth, home of your parents. So as I've explained this many times, that this refers to really the secret of all movement. And that is that you have to free yourself of your subjectivity. Many people will say, like Stephen Covey's Seven Habits, that the, the eye and the, they have to have your eye on the destination. That's true to some extent, but there's something that's neglected. The destination is not as important as to get away from where you are. Because you can have a very focused, clear picture of where you want to reach. But what happens without the invisible forces that are keeping you trapped to where you are? So you may even see the destination. You may have it very clear, but then you embark on your journey, and you have a ball and chain weighing you down of your past, your baggage of your past that doesn't let you travel. That's the problem. So one half of it is the knowing the destination, but an even important part, more important part is what, what part of your past doesn't let you move. And in one word, it's subjectivity. It's your own subjective forces that keep you trapped. And, there, and what God is telling Abraham, and he's telling each of us, every journey begins by leaving, or at least identifying and recognizing the three form, forces of subjectivity that keep you trapped. And what are they? Number one, inherent self-love. The blind spots and the biases of self-love, we minimize when it comes to ourselves. We don't see things clearly. They're blurred. They're uh, under underestimated usually. Sometimes our strengths are overestimated. Sometimes the other way around. Sometimes we think much worse of ourselves than we really should be. 
It's exaggerated. It's amplified. It's distorted. That's how it is. It's human nature. Which is why we go to advisors, consultants that are objective. Because we can't really see, especially when it comes to something that's emotional. The second subjectivity is our parental influences. Beis Avicha, the home of our parents. As I mentioned earlier, and quite obvious, in our formative years, our parents shape us, for good or for bad. And we pick up things. And finally, the third thing that traps us is social, cultural programming. Social pressure, peer pressure. You know, we don't want to stand out. You don't want to come. You want to look. Maybe you want to look a little cool, a little different, but within the framework of what people consider acceptable. To stand out is a very difficult thing for us. Even though we all like to think we're originals and we're trailblazers, but it's not that simple. It comes to really doing something that stand up for your conscience when everybody's going the other direction takes a lot of courage. And it's all normal. These three forces are all natural forces. Not, they don't make us evil. They make us, they create problems when you consider this to be all fine and good. But they trap you. And that, those are three forces that are the key thing that God tells Abraham. You want to find yourself, the land that I will show you, means not just the land, I will show you the land, I will show you who you are. You need to some way free yourself from these forces. Which is why, think about your own life. First times you really start understanding yourself or identifying some of your strengths is usually when you leave home. First time you go to summer camp, to dorm, to travel, you know, whenever those years are. It shouldn't be too early, because the earlier on a person's life, just like a bird in a nest, it's important to be in your nest, in your hearth, nurtured. But a bird that's nurtured properly will have the strength and courage to fly when it has to fly. And when it goes to fly the first time, that's when you really see what your strengths are like. Because now your father and mother are not there haunting you. I don't mean haunting necessarily in a negative way. Their presence is not defining you. Now you have to make a decision. And initially it can be somewhat um, overwhelming, somewhat difficult. And in general, most of the talents and skills that we discover are usually not when we're in the presence of those that have shaped us. It's when you have to be on your own and suddenly there's no one else to do it. Hey, why don't you do it? I don't know how to do it. And then you do it and you realize, hey, I'm not bad at it. Many things happen through this type of experimentation that happens outside of the nest, so to speak. So even in the healthiest family, it was a beautiful, healthy family. I'm not talking about a dysfunctional, a very functional one. It also comes a time where the umbilical cord needs to be cut, metaphorically speaking. And this happens many times in our lives. Whether it's the first time we go to school, when we're three, four years old, or whatever age today, two years old. Or the first time we leave home. Or, the first, or, the, or when we get married and we build our own homes. Or when we travel and we come to a new place. But obviously... We have, as I said, our fears and our routines that stop us from the lech lecha in our lives. But that's a critical component. I'm not suggesting here with this evening everybody can suddenly go on the lech lecha journey, but I am suggesting that you can begin to identify, is this true? What baggage is holding you back? And being honest and having the courage to acknowledge that you may not be as courageous as you think you are, that you may be more trapped than you think you are, is the beginning of your Redemption. I know you think the beginning is to just begin traveling. No, the beginning is to identify what is it that weighs me down. What are these three factors? Now, all these three factors weigh us, affect us all the time. But, but different ones affect us more than others. Understanding it is a critical component to freeing yourself of it. And that's what Abraham begins with, the, the Lech Lecha. And then we go to the verses I was reading. That What is the battle? The battle is over our souls. Over our psyches. Because to put it bluntly, especially as stated in Hasidic thought, Kabbalistic thought, your soul is a wild, free spirit. I mean in a good way wild. Untamed, un, unfettered. Left to its own, it, nothing, it would be, it's completely fearless. You have inside of you a, a soul that is alive, like a fire that is uncontained. Yeah, of course, a fire that's uncontained could also cause damage. But it also has that fearlessness. The same words that God says to Abraham, do not fear, is similar words were said to a young boy a little more than 300 years ago. 
His name was Yisrael Baal Shem Tov. Became the father of the Hasidic movement, the founder of the Hasidic movement. Yisrael Baal Shem Tov's father passed away, died when he was very young. He was just a few years old. On his father's deathbed, his father said to him two things. He said to him, remember, fear nothing but God. And the second thing, love everyone unconditionally. Now you can imagine, it's a nice lines. I mean we read them many times, but when you hear them when you're young, at three years old, from a father whose last words from his mouth, makes a deep impression. You know, we should all have our parents for many healthy years. But imagine if our parents told this to us every day, these two statements. And I just told it, lived it, examples. These things have deep impact. It's far harder to tell this to someone who's already a terrified adult and say, hey, I forgot to mention to you that you shouldn't fear anything. Yeah, but now I've developed deep fears. I've told the story, I think, of my uncle, Olav Shalom. His name is Yosef Itzik, my mother's brother. When he was a little boy, my grandmother told me the story. It's my maternal grandmother. That one night there was a thunderstorm. And he was scared, you know, child wakes up, middle of a thunderstorm, it was a very loud thunderstorm. He comes running to his mother's bed, my grandmother. She calms him down. What are you afraid of? He says, the thunder. So she tells him, you don't have to fear anything except God. He goes back to sleep, somewhat soothed, quieted, calmed. Well, the thunderstorms go. There was another thunderstorm a little while later. The thunder started rumbling again. And again, he gets terrified. He comes running to his mother's bed. Now what? He says, I told you. He says, I'm afraid of God. That's what he answers. By him now, instead of saying thunder, he said God, you know. So, what did the Baal Shem Tov, what would the father of the Baal Shem Tov mean when he told us to his son, and what does God mean here? Well, we really need to identify what God means. That's the real key thing here. As I've discussed many, many times, countless times, the word God is a very deceptive word, which really means nothing, frankly, because what does God mean? For many of us, God is some guy with a long white beard in heaven that's uh, sitting on a throne waiting to strike us with lightning when we misbehave. Mm -hmm. So, a more sophisticated definition of God, actually I've documented, if any of you have seen Toward a Meaningful Life, my book, you can read the chapter on God, I spelled it out there specifically from the sources. God is far more complicated than that, obviously. It's not a nursery school, childish version of God. As a matter of fact, Many of the fears that are associated with religion, fear, dogma, intimidation, anger, guilt, are associated with a false god, with a god that I would say is not a real god. As one of the great rebels once said to, an, to a self-proclaimed atheist, the god you don't believe in, I also don't believe in. <clears throat> so that type of god is this type of like big principle in the sky, you know, like school principle, angry, Catches us when we make a mistake, we've sinned, and now you're going to be punished. This is the typical knee-jerk reaction most of us have to a biblical God, which is why so many people reject it. What kind of what you know? And for good reason. What is this? God is you, just a big, angry father, grandfather, uncle, principal? You know, like like the angriest guy we can remember from our childhood that like terrorized little children, type of thing. We call the ogre. However, when you understand God as Abraham came to discover God, that God is not some type of man-made fantasy, a man-made um, fear machine. God is the essence of all reality. And actually, we can't really define God, because any definition we give would be a human definition. So then how do we relate to this? We relate to it through process of elimination. We know God is nothing that man can create. It has to be something that is beyond us. That creates us, not we create it. I'm not getting down to the word creation. The point being, as I said, the whole dictates the part, not the part, the whole. And Abraham discovered this by, as I said, through seeking. And he realized, get my ego out of the way. Get my subjective elements out of the way. And this reality, this deeper reality emerges. Just like when you shut down your senses, your eyes, your ears, or as I mentioned before, the thinking of the refrigerator, that I'm it, certain truths emerge. That's called resonance. 
You want to hear the melody and music within yourself, the melody and music within another person, you have to get yourself out of the way. If you're busy in a rush hour, if your mind is cluttered with all kinds of things, you're not going to be able to hear someone that loves you or you love speak to you. You have other things going on that are distracting you. Turbulence is called. If you want to hear the soul, your soul speak, you want to hear the soul of, of your child speak, if you want to hear the soul of anyone you love, you have to shut down all these noises. Now, noises don't just mean physical noises. It means all our preoccupations. That's the process of finding truth. It's the shutting down. That's the process. Lech lecha, the leaving behind, the shedding of old layers and new layers can emerge. It's a secret to all growth. Because as long as the future is a product of the past, then it's not the future. You know, someone say, I want it on my terms. Okay, you'll have what your terms are, and that's where it stays. It's like they say, or they say, it's an expression I've coined. I don't know where it comes from. It's a combination of many places. If you think what you thought, and you speak what you spoke, and you do what you did, what are you going to have? It's simple mathematics. What you had. But what what do they say is a sign of insanity? Doing the same thing again and again and expecting different results. Or in the healing world they say, if nothing changes, nothing changes. But we want better results by doing the same thing you did before. How exactly is that supposed to work? It doesn't work that way. You want a different result, you better do something differently. But that requires work. And that requires challenging yourself. And that requires looking whether you made mistakes. And that's far more uncomfortable. So you can throw the ball the same way every time. It's going to bounce back the same way. You have to throw it a different way. Maybe throw a different ball. Or maybe not throw a ball altogether. Maybe try something new. That's lech lecha. It's getting yourself out of the way. I know it sounds odd. You say, what do you mean? I'm trying to solve my problem. Why, why should I get, how can I solve the problem if I'm not there? Uh-huh. The you that you think is there is what you're getting out of the way. And maybe another you will emerge that you're not aware of. That's the whole secret of all the growth. Someone shares with you an idea, and it, and it contradicts an idea that you're very firmly convinced of. An t- intelligent person doesn't just say, hey, I'm just not going to let any new ideas, I have it all figured out. An intelligent person will hear it, review it, and challenge themselves. Now, I don't mean we have to do this every second. Obviously, we've made decisions based on certain research. But especially when it comes to personal matters, if you're not ready to challenge yourself, forget about it. Where's, where are you going to exactly find solutions? You want everything else to change around you except you. That's both childish and obviously subjective. Abraham realized that to find God, it takes a real, a real price. You have to be able to surrender your ego and not obliterate or annihilate yourself. It's an act of strength. Restraint, when it comes to allowing spiritual, your spiritual voice to emerge, takes a lot more strength than the arrogant voice that does not let those voices emerge. Love is a celebration of vulnerability, as I discussed last week. Which for many sounds very odd. What do you mean? I don't, want, I don't like to be vulnerable. Why am I celebrating it? But when you're strong enough to celebrate your vulnerability, you're strong enough to find out who you really are. Yes, it's true we live in a cruel world. We live in a world where there are predators. There are forces. There are people who can exploit and, and uh, take advantage. So I'm not suggesting suddenly letting your guard down, but at the same time, you have to also always have in the second half of your consciousness and psyche that maybe there's an opportunity that I'm going to meet somebody new, not to judge everybody, that everybody is for sure cruel and exploitive, just because everybody I've met till now. That's also part of opening yourself up to new realities. Obviously, it has to be done with care. But to close yourself off and says, because I've been hurt so many times, I'm not going to let myself be hurt again, is obviously undermining yourself. So when the Hashem Tov heard from his father, don't fear anything but God, he wasn't saying tremble before God, don't tremble before man. He was saying, no, anything man-made is superficial. Anything man-made is as strong as you are. Why would you be afraid of something that's like you? Everything man-made is mortal, temporary, impermanent. Why are you afraid of impermanent things? You want to have something to stand in awe of. Stand in awe of the permanence of reality, of something that's eternal. Something that isn't man-made. And you know what that is? Inside of you, it's your soul. 
The soul is the God within us. It is the flame, as I said. Ner Hashem Nishma Sodom, the flame of God. It is an eternal flame. And left on its own, it's fearless. But it's trapped in a fearful body. It's trapped in a terrified and frightened world. Because you see, materialism by definition is a frightened place. Why? Because anyone who knows, you know, think of it like in a um, poker game or any type of negotiation. If you know your, 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 your um, hand is weak, yeah, you may be able to fake it because we live in a world that there's a lot of fakery going on. But ultimately, you know that it's weak. Materialism, by definition, cannot have confidence. How could it have confidence? Everything that's in material world dies. How could something that dies really be confident? How confident can we be? Some of the Buddhist schools of thought say that all fears come down to the fear of death. Because everyone subconsciously or unconsciously knows that they will one day not be here. And that insignificance, that type of finality, affects everything we do in our lives. The entire philosophy is based on this. That's why we're ambitious. That's why we try to make a mark. That's why we become more arrogant. That's why we step on others. It's all to find some way to make sure that we are perpetuated. Because materialism, by definition, is, a, is weak. Is a weak hand. It's mortal. It erodes. It ages. It dies. As the Rabbeinu Bachai says in a... It's a sad statement, but also a very true statement... When do we begin to age? So no one wants to know, right? Well, you begin to age as soon as you're born. Because if you're not one years old, two years old, you're never going to become 50 years old and 80 years old and 90. So as soon as a child is born, it's already beginning to age. It's just that it's not obvious then. The child is still on the up. But if you think about it, it's just a matter of time. So if you put all your confidence in material success, in material prosperity, how... Can a, how confident can a person really be? How secure can you be if you've built your whole structure on an insecure foundation? Or a foundation that everyone knows cannot last? So what's the alternative? The alternative is, this is what God says to Abraham. Now that you've discovered a higher reality, and that it's a part of you, that by shedding, by um, un that's the word I want to use. Yes, shedding. Shedding the layers of your ego. Shedding the layers of your consciousness and connecting to me, meaning to a higher reality, will cause you to fear nothing. And that's exactly what happened to the Baal Shem Tov. He lived a life that was fearless. Basically a life of the soul instead of a life of the body. So what really keeps us trapped? Yes, it's our subjectivity. But our subjectivity is the domain of our conscious awareness of our lives. When you, for example, find out, let's say you're at work, and some emergency, God forbid, happens. Let's say a good emergency. Suddenly, if it's really important to you, you're really not going to care about what anybody else thinks around you. You think when mothers saw their children being ripped away from them, when they were being carted like animals into the whole, into the concentration camps, you think those mothers and fathers cared about whether, what they're going to look like tomorrow and what makeup they have on and what clothing they're wearing. Because when it comes to matters that are real survival, suddenly you realize what really matters. Now, no one should ever have to come to a point of such a low point. But it just shows you that we live superficial lives. And the more a person relates to their soul, and lives a soulful life, the less fear they develop. It's a simple formula. The reason it's not simple is because we're addicted to the material world in which we live. And I use the word addicted very deliberately. Addicted means addicted. We are dependent on it to the point we don't think we can live without it. Now, God wanted us to be live in a material world. So that's part of the purpose. This isn't about an ascetic lifestyle or compromising our material lives. It's a question, however, of what we worship. You worship matter, you worship man-made things, you will be trapped by the fears that come with the material world. There's no two ways around it. So there's a battle for ten li hanefesh. Who will control your soul? So ask yourself this question. Who's controlling it today and tomorrow? Who controls your soul? Not your body. Your body we know is controls. The material world controls your body. You need food, you need sustenance, you need shelter, you need 
an income. But what about your soul? Is your also is your soul also being held hostage by those forces? So there's that story I often tell, which to me captures the whole idea so vividly, of the previous Chabad Rebbe of Yosef Yitzchak when he was arrested in 1927, and he chose to, he refused to cooperate with the authorities. Now we're talking about here, basically one step away from the Nazis were the Bolsheviks, especially regard to Jews, Stalin. They had no mercy at all. And he, for his own pride, because he did not want his soul to be compromised, refused to cooperate. So one of the Jewish captors, and they were worse than the the non-Jewish ones, Jewish anti-Semites are always worse, pointed a gun to his head and said to him, Rebbe, it's time to start cooperating. He spoke in Yiddish to him. Because you see, this gun here has made many people cooperate. You know, the threat of killing him. And the Rebbe calmly said to him, this toy, that's what he called it, this toy can frighten someone who has one world and many gods, but not someone who has one god and many worlds. And the end of the story, by the way, is that the guy who held the gun to him ended up being killed later, and this Rebbe ended up being freed and came to America, as a matter of fact. So, you never know who's in power, who's in control. It may look like controller right there. Yeah, material control, the one with the gun, of course, was more power. What the Rebbe was saying was the secret to all of life. Who is your God? If your material life, your refrigerator, is your God, so then you have only one God. One, that, that's, that's your God. So then when death comes, it's over. Everything is over. That's um, one world and many gods. But as someone who this world is just one step, of many journeys. Not that he wanted to be killed, not that he did not embrace and celebrate life, but you're not going to frighten me with telling me that one stage of my existence is going to stop. Because I have something that's far more eternal. Now all this would be nice words if it was like just a uh, pontificating uh, session here. But as the Jewish people as a whole are actually living witnesses to this truth. You explain to me how they're here today. We're barely 14, 15 million people. What's the percentage of the population? It's less than one, right? Less than 0.1. And yet, 40% of Nobel Prizes. I'm not saying this to pull rank. We do not have empire, empires, nor money, nor nations. Until 50 years ago, we didn't even have a land. And even now, with a land, what is it? The size of New Jersey. Surrounded by hundreds of millions of who don't want it there. So what is the secret of Jewish survival? No one has ever been able to really figure it out. Because if you could, why not package it and sell the formula to everybody? Who wouldn't want such survival? The Dalai Lama, when people visit him, Jews visit him, I've heard this from several Jews, the first question he asked them always is what was the secret of you lasting thousands of years without a, a country? Now he's obviously asking for personal reasons because he's out of his country, exiled, and he's concerned what will happen with his following followers. So what is the secret? The secret is exactly what I just said. Jews never worshipped the material. So empires meant nothing. The Romans had one of the greatest empires of all time. The Greeks the Persians, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Spanish Empire, the Ottoman Empire. What are we, what's left of all of them? Memories, some literature, a nation that claims to be the direct descendants of the Romans? No. Even the great Aristotle, even the great thinkers who left great legacies, ideas, principles that shape modern life, why didn't Aristotle feel it necessary to pass on to his children and grandchildren his teachings? That there would be an Aristotelian community, so to speak. It doesn't exist. He didn't even make it an aspiration. Abraham made it very clear, and he was a great philosopher, Abraham, that beyond my philosophy, the biggest commitment I make, to make sure that my children and my family, my home, 
the generations to come will perpetuate the legacy of justice and charity that I have embraced. Which means he built his foundations not on his wealth, which he had plenty of, not on his material success, but on his faith, on the promise. And his grandchildren are sitting right here in this room now. And all over the world, small number, but what they have in quality is very hard to find elsewhere. Now, I'm not saying Jews don't have their problems. I'm not saying every individual Jew has it all worked out. But as a whole, we've made it here. And the reason nobody has ever been able to replicate the formula is because the price is a very high price. You cannot worship the material world as much as you worship the spiritual world. When Mordechai paid the heavy price and everyone bowed to Haman, he refused to bow to him. It almost ended up causing the demise of the Jewish people. But he would not bow to something man-made. And in every generation, there were those individuals. Today, the sad fact is that most Jews have no clue why we made it till here and what we, what we stand for. So strangely, prosperity and freedom is causing more problems and is more challenge to assimilation than all those enemies we've had. Because that's what happens. Comforts create complacency. So today the battle is against apathy, complacency, indifference. But the secret to bring it back to our personal lives, the secret it comes down to is knowing that right now inside of you, your heart is beating and your soul is beating. And that soul is a fearless force that can, does not take no for an answer and nothing is impossible for it. The only question is how much of that soul is actively involved in your life. And usually it's a very small percentage. Children, young children, the soul is 99% control of their lives. Obviously a child cries for food, for tired, pain, and so on. That's survival. But the child's spirit, its enthusiasm, look at its enthusiasm, its excitement about things, is fearless. So yes, so we dismiss it by saying, okay, because the child's naive, it doesn't know, blah, blah. Tell it about the fears of life the cruelties of life, and the child will become fearful. It's not true. The child will become fearful when we teach it to become fearful. I'm not suggesting growing up means maintaining that type of reckless free abandon. It means being, being seasoned, wise, and understanding, but not letting the soul be extinguished or diminished as a result of the fears. As I said many times, Jews have suffered greatly, but we have not become sufferers. Just because there are things to fear in this world doesn't mean you have to become a fearful person. It's one thing being prudent and having fear in a given situation. Another is becoming a person of fear. You know, fear should be a verb in our lives, not a noun. A noun is a state of being. A state of being, I am a fearful person. That's trouble. That's disaster, actually. To say, I have fears at times, okay, there are things to have fear over. But the, but the, the faith and the connection, that fear nothing but that which is beyond us, that which is eternal, is the secret. So the question is, how then do we connect to the soul? How can we bring the soul more into our lives than it is right now? Well, I think you don't need a lot. Use your common sense. You know what you have to do? You have to give it time. Just like if your child says to you, I need mommy or tati or father, your papa or mama, whatever we call it, abba, ima, father, mother. Your child says, I need attention. There's only one way to give a child attention. It's to give the child attention. How does that sound for logic? Same thing with the soul. We need to give our soul more attention. We need to feed it. We nourish our bodies. You have to learn to nourish your soul. How do you nourish your soul? By being aware, number one, of it. By two, by being a more sensitive person. And you wake up in the morning, before you jump into the material world, acknowledge that I have a soul inside of me. It's invisible, but it's the driving force. Ask your soul, what would you like to do today? What can we do that's fearless? How do we take on a challenge? And you'll be surprised that this soul has plenty to say. And there are actually books. There are Hebrew books and English books, Torah literature that talks to the soul, that describes the soul, that makes the soul feel comfortable. Now, what we have a minuscule taste of it is like when we listen to music. When you listen to music, sometimes you feel you can do anything because music suddenly awakens that youthfulness, reminds us, but it doesn't last long. Because music is more of a, almost like a drug. I don't mean it in a bad way. But it's a drug, meaning it hasn't been internalized, integrated 
It just sparks something. The question is, how do you hold on to that? That requires soulfulness. And there's soulful way of living, and there's bodyful way of living. It's not the same thing. Every given situation, tell me anefesh. Who's going to control your soul? You have one voice that says, take. Another voice that says, give. You meet somebody. You have those two choices. To give or to take. To be self-oriented or self-centric, egocentric or God-centric. <clears throat> Abraham, when someone come, came his way, a stranger, first thing he thought, how could I help this person? He didn't think, how could that person help me? Now, I'm not suggesting, again, that we shouldn't have opportunities. If we're in working and business, obviously there's situations where we'd like to um, get people support. We want clients, we want customers. But that's a part of your life. That's, that's what you've got to do for survival. It's not the primary driving force in your life has to be is, what am I giving? How much have I given today? It's a completely different mindset, but that's how the soul thinks. You see, because the soul is secure, it doesn't need to take to be more, to be greater. The body needs... The body doesn't get something, it feels inadequate. The soul doesn't give, it feels inadequate. Completely different rules of the game. But what you get in return is great confidence. That Rebbe wasn't playing a game, he wasn't being cute when he said, he had a gun to his head with a bullet in it. He was sincere. He was not frightened. He was not frightened by man-made things. Not that he wanted to die. He ended up not dying. Not to whether we have such presence of mind for all of us, probably not. But there's a opening statement in the Shulchan Aruch, the code of Jewish law that says, Al yevish maligim, do not be embarrassed by those that will mock you, that will laugh at you. Essentially saying that the first opening statement is, do not be afraid of standing out. Do not be afraid of being different. We're not talking about being different just to be different. We're not, we're not be afraid to be who you are. And everyone talks about Steve Jobs commencement address to Stanford. That's basically what he said. He didn't read it in the Parsha Lech Lecha, but he got it somewhere else. But this is essentially the story of Abraham. When Once he discovered what he discovered, he didn't really care whether his parents liked it or didn't, or whether society liked it. He did what he did. And look what, what, what we have today as a result of him. And he had to face plenty of challenges besides being mocked. So there's an ongoing battle going on right now over your soul. Who will control it? Think of it like a hammer and a hand. Does the, does the hammers of your life, do the tools of your life tell your hands where to go? Or do your hands tell the hammer where to go? Now it would be a little what we, odd, right? If your glove told your hand where to go. Or that your tool told your hand where to go. But that's essentially how we live our lives. Our bodies take our souls for a ride. Whatever our whim, whatever whim, whatever desire. It should be the other way around. The captain of the ship should be your soul. The soul is the driving force. And the body is a tool to implement. The vision of your life comes from the soul. The body has no vision. The body is a survival force. The body is like fuel. It feeds, it eats, it breeds, protects you. The wall around your soul, the body. But the soul is a force that is... In most cases, starving within us because it gets so little nourishment as we get older because most of the time we're busy nourishing our body and our material part of our lives. So there's a battle of ten liya nefesh. Who will give me the soul? The body wants the soul and your soul wants its own freedom. And the key to all courage and the antidote to fear is how much of that soul will speak to you in your daily life. It's as simple as that. And the challenge that we have is how do we begin tonight and tomorrow? Well, my friends, there's only one way. is to do things differently. You don't do things differently, you're not going to have different results. How do you do things differently? You try new things, and not necessarily fr- frightening things or threatening or some type of cold turkey change of your whole life. You start tonight, instead of falling asleep with the television on, with a newspaper in your nose, read a spiritual poem, hear a nice song, Go, go to sleep, not with the thoughts that burden you all day. That's not what you should be. You should find something that breaks from that day, from the material anxieties of your life, and find something that is, speaks to your soul. It could be anything. And let that be what enters the, the resting 
hours of your sleep. And when you wake up in the morning, instead of immediately thinking you know, what obligations I have today, what job obligations, other obligations, say a short prayer. I've always suggested the prayer, Moda'ani. I acknowledge to you for returning my soul to me. Say it any words you like, meditate any way you wish. But say it sincerely, not just lip service. Focus on what just happened. I just slept and now I'm aware. Pop my eyes open. Now, of course, most of us hear the alarm clock first. Today, alarm clocks have all kinds of new interesting sounds based on the new smartphones. But forget about the alarm clock. What just happened? For several hours, you were asleep, not really aware. Think about the life force inside of you. What does it mean? Why were, why were, you, giving a, why were you given a new day? What can you do today to make your little corner of the world a bit more refined? The difficulty in what everything I'm saying here is not in doing it. It's the routines that we have that we don't do it. And because we don't do it, it's difficult to start a new thing. It's like starting to brush your teeth after you haven't done it for 30 years. I don't mean to use that example, but that's just it's an example. So, of course, if we did this with our children every day and it became a pattern, that would be the, a great gift. But at this point, this is what we should do. You'll say, well, how is that going to solve my problems? I have a difficulty finding my soulmate. You tell me I should say Modani in the morning? It doesn't seem commensurate with my big, huge problems. But, you know, every huge problem began somewhere, small. And every huge problem is resolved with something small. Nothing happens. There's no panacea. There's no magic trick. It's just like anything. You, un- you get tangled. Your life gets tangled up. You can't just untangle it in one shot. Start untangling the edges, the beginnings, the places you could reach. And clarity breeds clarity. So someone say, well, I'm completely confused about the most important things in my life. So start in the areas that you could find that are a little easier, less resistance. Find some clarity there. As I said, clarity breeds clarity. And confusion breeds confusion. And it's also one of the traps. Because when we're overwhelmed by our problem, our problem dominates and dictates. And unless we find a solution to the direct problem, we ignore everything else. And it's not correct. It starts with, if you've been breathing toxins for a long extended period of time, the first step is to start breathing healthy air. You say, what about all those toxins? You know, start a little breathing every day, a little healthy air, and you know what's going to happen? Slowly, it'll start filling your lungs. Slowly replace where those toxins are, and then we'll begin to have a, a fighting chance. Now, obviously, there are situations where you need to have additional strength. You know, God forbid, uh, you bring a person who's got, been in an accident or something has happened to them that's very, uh, that is very uh, traumatic. So the first thing you have to do is stop the bleeding. Short-term solutions. But then you have to find the longer-term ones, the ones that last, that are sustainable. So there's no such thing as anything too small. The smallest things can make the biggest difference. As a matter of fact, it's much more trustworthy to do something in small day, day to day than find some cramming session where you can say, oh, this is it, all my problems are solved. Last week, Barry told me an expression. I'm trying to ask you to tell me that. Those few words you said to me, what were those words? Can you remind me? A few English words that were a combination of uh, interesting, not euphoria, harmony. Was it harmony? Beauty. What's beauty? Beauty, the original root of the word beauty is the act of responding to your own calling. Interesting. That's beauty. What do we most of us think beauty is? Some fashion magazine. Botox. Some external. The, res- the response, the act of responding to your own calling. Thoreau put it this way. Is the sound working, by the way, because this is on red. Do you see it going up and down? <clears throat> yeah? So he says like this, most men lead lives of quiet desperation. But then the second half, and die with their song still inside them. Abraham taught us that you don't have to die with your song still inside you. You don't have to die at all, for that matter. And you can access that song. That's real beauty, inner beauty. No problem with outer beauty, but they should be aligned. If outer beauty replaces inner beauty, it's trouble. Because then you're worshipping things that no way can last. There's no way outer beauty can last. Preserve inner beauty 
and you'll have outer beauty too. Because it all depends on different stages. What was that other word, Barry? Just besides beauty. Just getting it for the record. It was good uh, expressions. Well, if it comes to you, you'll tell me. Yeah, some of these interesting words, when you trace them to their root, they t- t- teach you a lot of interesting things. Disaster means to lose your guiding star. Yeah, that's a good one. Right. And you can only find your star when you're in total darkness. That's interesting. Well, I want to wish everybody that they should find their star even if they're not in total darkness. Even though most of us are in total darkness, so that's moot. But the point is, yes, a disaster. So different beauty is finding your own star and disaster is not finding your star. <laughs> okay. And it's interesting to talk about stars. This first, the Torah also says that God says to Abraham at the end of this chapter, he says, look up to heaven. Just looking for the exact expression. Um, yeah. This is 15 uh, verse 5. So after God tells him, do not be afraid, I will be your shield. So it's a divine shield. He says, he took him outside. God took, let Abraham outside of his tent and said, please look heavenward and count the stars if you're able to count them. And then he answers, then God says to him, this is how numerous your descendants will be. Now the words actually doesn't say numerous, it says, this is how your children will be. So Rashi, the commentary says numerous. But the stars also reflect this is how they will be, which means that they will always shine. As you just said, even in darkness, they will shine. And they will be as num- numerous as the stars. Now, of course, it doesn't mean as numerous because, as I said before, we're only 14 million strong. But we're everywhere. As many anti Semites like to remind the world. And, um, and we have influence. And we are fighters. And we're examples of survival. And the promise was fulfilled. Thousands of years ago, Abraham was told this. And this is all in reward. Not reward, a magical reward. A direct result because Abraham paid the ultimate price. He, He chose eternity over temporary pleasure. Over instant gratification. It's a difficult challenge. I mean, we all have those moments, right? Who of us has not been seduced by instant gratification? It's very, very powerful. But look at the results of a person who forewent. Can you say forewent? That he foregoed, whatever the word is. You get the idea. And he, he allowed himself to embrace that which was eternal. This is why Abraham is unique. Because it doesn't come every day. And he paved a way that he had no one to look at. He did this all by himself. His, even his parents, who we know Terach is his father, we only know Terach exists because of Abraham. So I want to conclude by wishing everyone that we should all be live up to be the shining stars that Abraham saw in that heaven that night. And that if Abraham was here today, we'd be proud of us. That we in our own small or big way, forge our own paths. And don't let the song die inside of us. And the key to it is to recognize your soul within you, embrace it, feed it. You have to nourish it. Find a, a class once a week, or once a day if you if possible, that f- feeds your soul. You wake up in the morning, go to sleep at night, find ways to feed that soul. Throughout the day, through a kind acts of kindness, Random acts of kindness, meaning even if it's um, ba- uh, unconditional, not necessarily you're going to gain something directly from it. The more soulfulness, the more sensitivity, the more refined behavior you do day after day, the more your soul is fed, and the so- stronger your soul becomes, the more fearless you become. Try it out and tell me if it works.
You're not going to find fearlessness except that way. There's no other trick. That is guaranteed. Because you then become more confident in your soul, and it becomes confident in you, and you realize, I have all the power in the world. I have the power to be as kind as I want to be. If you're going to be dependent on others, and they Huh? It's going? So, to sum up, we're not dependent on anyone for our souls. If we're dependent on anything, it's purely for bodily things. But your soul is dependent on your attitude, your approach, your your um, disposition. So God shall bless us all to be those stars, those shining stars, that Abraham be proud of us. As I said, we blaze and trailblaze and forge new paths and new openings. As I said, try it out. Feed your soul in the morning, in the evening, during the day. More. So thank you very much.